Have you ever wondered what the catalyst for urbanisation was as a way of life compared to the nomadic lifestyle of our distant ancestors? These cities, Damascus, Jericho, each lay came to being one of the oldest cities in the world. What was it that made humans in these regions decide we are going to stay put? We are going to organise ways of bringing the things we need to us, food, water, warmth. We are confident we can do that. It is claimed by some that urbanisation as a way of life emerged following the stabilisation of the climate around 10,000 years ago. Here you see the temperature fluctuations over the past 100,000 years quite dramatically stabilising. The argument goes that climatic stability made permanent agriculture possible, which in, terms, in turn made permanent settlement possible. That urbanisation was enabled only as humans mastered the capacity to scale up their manipulation of nature rather than having to live to its rhythms. As our established way of life in contemporary cities is challenged by global scale environmental change, it is useful to unpack some of the quiet assumptions upon which our cities have been designed and our urban lifestyles based. In particular, what environmental disturbances have we been systematically designing out in attempts to defeat order in urban settings? With such rapid technological advancement and the globalisation of social, cultural and economic networks, what have we become blind to and does this matter? I grew up in Melbourne, but for the last five years have lived in Swedish Lapland in a smallish town called Luleå, just south of the Arctic Circle. This is, experience has given me a new appreciation of the extent to which humans go to cope with environmental variation and our inventiveness in this respect. The day we left Melbourne in early January 2006, it was plus 43.5 degrees and the sun was scorching. The day we arrived in Luleå, it was minus 20. Semi-regularly it gets so cold that on my walk to work, icicles form on my eyelashes. The waters of the Gulf of Bothnia between Sweden and Finland freeze for months on end and form an ice layer more than a metre thick that you can drive on. Being so close to the Arctic Circle, the sun is up for only one hour a day at the winter solstice. Here, I am taking our children down to the harbour ice at midwinter. We left home at sunrise at 12 noon, enjoyed an hour of daylight with the sun just hovering over the horizon and headed back to thaw out, thaw out in the sauna an hour later at sunset. Luleå is a city that has long had to cope with environmental disturbance. In 1621, the King of Sweden formally declared Luleå a town. By 1649, the town of Luleå had to be relocated to lower ground because the ships could no longer reliably get to port. You see, the land was still rising as the glaciers continued to retreat. The top picture here is the old town. You can see the ships at the port on the right, and as land has risen, this has become prime residential real estate. In the bottom picture, you can see the location of new, the new town, about 10 kilometres downstream. Land continues to rise in Luleå today at a rate of approximately one centimetre a year. Channels throughout the Luleå archipelago are still regularly dredged. The point I want to illustrate is that humans are incredibly adaptive, inventive, and able to overcome most environmental disturbances in cities. We have been outstandingly successful in our pursuits. It is claimed that we live now not in an age of empires or the nation state, but the age of cities. And in rich cities like Melbourne, like Luleå, most of the time we enjoy the unbridled benefits of that order, of the adaptation of nature to our needs. However, to mistakenly believe that this makes us resilient would be unwise, for there is, I believe, a paradox inherent to the pursuit of urban resilience. Cities have been designed to remove or minimise environmental disturbances. A resilience approach demonstrates the importance of living with disturbances. So what is resilience and why does it matter? There are many different types of resilience, engineering resilience, community resilience, psychological resilience. Today I'm going to talk about social ecological resilience, which is the capacity of a system to deal with change, either through persistence, adaptation or transformation. There are three key assumptions underpinning social ecological resilience. First, social ecological systems are linked. This means that both social and ecological systems impact upon one another and on an ongoing basis. 
In one respect, this is obvious. Since the environmental revolution of the 60s and 70s, there's been much more widespread recognitions that humans significantly affect the environment. That, for example, widespread spread pesticide use can wipe out populations of songbirds and silence the spring as so well articulated by Rachel Carson. What perhaps isn't so well appreciated is our reciprocal dependence on the environment. Following the unusually hot summer in 2010, continued drought and bushfires devastated Russia's wheat crops. As a result, food prices for certain staples increased and deadly rioting broke out on the streets of Mozambique. We are dependent on the environment, on the services nature provides, nature's gifts, to borrow from the Australian National Anthem, for food, water, genetic diversity, a stable climate and so much more. Resilience thinking reminds us that social ecological systems are linked and that we ignore this connection to our peril. The second assumption is that social ecological systems are complex adaptive systems where cause-effect relationships are non-linear. Frances Wesley and her colleagues use a great analogy to explain this. She argues there are three types of problems, simple, complicated and complex. An example of a simple problem is baking a cake. Here a recipe is essential, recipes are tested to assure replicability of later efforts, no particular expertise is required, although knowing how to cook does increase the chances of success. Recipes note the quantity and nature of the parts needed, produce standard products, and there's a certainty of results every time. With a complicated problem, like getting a rocket to the moon, formulae are critical and necessary, sending one rocket increases assurance the next will be okay, a high level of expertise is required, you can separate the problem into parts and then coordinate, rockets are similar in certain ways, and there's a high degree of certainty of outcome. Resilience applies to complex problems, more like raising a child. Formulae have only limited application. Raising one child gives no assurance of success with the next. Expertise can help, but is not sufficient. Relationships are the key. You can't separate parts from the whole. Every child is unique, and there's never, ever a certainty of outcome. Resilience thinking applies to complex problems where behaviour is unpredictable, be it of a child, the fickle market, nature, politicians. Complex problems require attention to thresholds and tipping points. Think of a coral reef. Here you see degradation from a healthy coral system to an unhealthy coral system, consisting eventually of slime and barren rock. This is caused by a combination of social and ecological factors chipping away at the resilience of the system, tipping the coral reef over thresholds into less healthy states. Here, overfishing and excess nutrients are at play. Of course, there's potential to bounce back, but if too many factors impact together or in quick succession, a healthy state cannot be retained or regained. And it's therefore critical to build redundancy into the system, aware that unexpected shocks, surprises, disturbances will come along. Indeed, resilience thinking assumes they will, and it's better to be prepared. Another metaphor that captures the importance of a dynamic understanding of complex systems is the adaptive cycle, represented by this figure eight. Think of a forest, which goes through stages of growth and maturity, followed by a disturbance such as a fire, which releases nutrients as a catalyst for reorganisation and exploitation on the way to a new cycle of growth. By focusing only on the exploitation and conservation phases, natural resource management has prioritised controlling disturbances, preventing extinguishing forest fires, unaware of the impact these management choices have on the overall resilience of the relevant social ecological systems. In the case of some forests, resilience is affected as some tree species require fire to release seeds for germination. And the longer a region goes without fire, the more intense and catastrophic the eventual fire of Event will be. The adaptive cycle encourages attention to the whole system dynamic, including processes of destruction and reorganisation. Furthermore, resilience thinking suggests that when disturbance is systematically designed out, resilience or a capacity to be adaptable in the face of change is reduced. The third assumption of resilience thinking is that cross-scale coordination is, is critical. For the first time in history, it is argued that humans are causing global scale changes in the biophysical processes of the Earth. We are in the so-called Anthropocene. Scientists have now identified nine planetary biophysical boundaries in an attempt to define a safe operating space for 
for humanity. It is argued that three of these, including biodiversity loss and climate change, have already been exceeded and that humanity stands on the edge of a tipping point. This is why sustainable urbanisation matters. In my research with senior strategic planners in Europe, the consistent view is that resilience thinking provides a new and useful way for them to frame the challenges of sustainable urbanisation. It does this in several ways. First, resilience encourages attention to persistence, adaptability and or transformation. Think of the way we manage water. These are all examples of achieving resilience in the face of environmental disturbance through persistence. This next set shows examples of achieving resilience through adaptability. You see multifamily floating canal houses, an elevated house to accommodate floodwaters, and a floating bridge. Finally, two examples where transformation was required by either restoring wetlands or through managed retreat. Here you see an abandoned beach house awaiting demolition. Keeping in mind all three ways of planning for resilience to environmental disturbance, persistence, adaptability and transformation is relevant to many challenges of sustainable urbanisation, not just hard infrastructure decisions, not just water management. The second way resilience thinking helps reframe complex problems of sustainable urbanisation is by steering away from simple approaches to complex problems. Governance of simple problems can assume stability, remove disturbance, prioritise scientific knowledge, be based on a hierarchical top-down approach. For complex problems, however, we need to assume change and uncertainty, nurture conditions for recovery and renewal after disturbance, combine different types of knowledge for learning and create opportunities for self-organisations. There are many different resilience strategies for resilience that can be employed in tackling complex problems. Redundancy can be built in, extra capacity to cope with beyond expected events. Systems can be compartmentalised to avoid cascading failure. Disturbance evoked, like bushfire management in the off season. Nurturing ecological diversity, social capital and social ecological memory can help ensure that if, when crisis strikes, when disturbance eventuates, there are the ecological and community resources to recover. Let me give you an example, the issue of food security. During the Second World War, Victory Gardens were critical to the health and sustenance of urban populations. In the US, it is claimed that up to 40% of vegetables were provided in this way. In the UK, the figures are even higher. In Havana, Cuba, following the oil crisis, it's claimed that up to 90% of the city's fresh produce came from urban agriculture. These were huge transitions enforced through hardship. We live in a time of increasing environmental uncertainty. If a black swan event occurred tomorrow, how resilient would Stockholm, Lulio or Melbourne's food supply be? Would we have the hard and soft infrastructure required to gear up urban food production, the physical space, access to knowledge about how to grow food, availability of pollinators, climate adapted seed or rootstock, oil non-dependent tools, machinery and fertilisers and so on? The chief planner of Lulio today, not an old man, grew up without fresh veg vegetables through the winter. That is why most older houses have a food cellar to store root vegetables, canned produce, dried fish, smoked reindeer, berries and so on, to see through to the next summer. In one generation so much has changed. Mangoes are now available all year round in Lulio supermarkets. By no means do I want to romanticise the past. Instead, I hope these examples draw attention to the paradox of urban resilience, the order, certainty and immunity to environmental disturbance offered in urban settings can blind us to our critical dependence on nature and ultimately reduce our social ecological resilience. To deal with the big environmental challenges of our time requires a willingness to live with these disturbances and restore or recreate the cross-scale feedbacks between social and ecological systems. I believe the metaphors of resilience thinking can help us find resilient practices that prioritise a precautionary approach to sustainable urbanisation. Thank you.